the King season is over, and it has been over for about a month now, and so I figure that's enough time to, you know, let it settle, and now we can go back and recap the season, and what I wanted to do in this one is do what I did for uh, the midway point, which was I gave everybody a rating out of 10, every player, and then I gave the, the overall team a rating out of 10, so I figured now that we've gone through the whole season, I could kind of revisit that and re-grade everyone. But before I do that, I just got to address address this. Ugh. It sticks to the desk. But this Draymond Green punching bag got this for my birthday. That's a great that's a great present. <laughs> it's a desktop punching bag with Draymond Green. So I thought I should just explain what that is over here. That's pretty funny. But anyways, uh, in that uh, mid-season ratings video I did, I started off by giving the overall team a grade. And so I, I gave them a 9. And at that point in the season, I can't remember exactly where we were in the standings, but I know we were in the top 6. And obviously surpassing expectations. Sabonis was playing amazing. Fox was playing really well. Really, everyone was playing well. And the only reason why it wasn't a 10 out of 10 was, I guess, one, because, you know, we hadn't made the playoffs yet. And so there was still time to, you know, fail. But uh, also because we had lost some games to bad teams who were on the second night of back-to-backs and, and lost those games at home. I remember that was kind of the main reason why it wasn't a 10 out of 10 because we'd lost, you know, a few games like that. But now that the season is over, we know the result, I think it's, it's very easy for me to say that this was a 10 out of 10 season for the Kings. And I, I'll gi give Mike Brown a 10 out of 10 as well, kind of put him in the overall team rating together because... Coming into the season, the expectations were just, you know, make the play in and try to make the playoffs from there. And getting the three seed to break the playoff drought and, you know, doing what we did in the first round, you know, we didn't get past the first round, but taking the defending champs to seven games, I think this team showed that they are legit. And, you know, like if we were, it were, to do the same thing next season and lose in the first round again, then that wouldn't be a 10 out of 10 season. But for this season, for the expectations coming into this season, and for just it being the first season with this core group of guys, it is without a doubt in my mind a 10 out of 10 season. The vibes were at an all-time high. And obviously Mike Brown has to get a lot of the credit for coming in and just totally changing the culture of the team. For so long, we were the ultimate bad vibes team for so many years. And then, you know, within a year, it just totally flips. And it's the exact opposite. And also, you know, a big shout out to Vivek Ranadive and whoever else was part of coming up with the beam. Because... I mean, that takes some guts to do, to, to make this beam after every win before the season even started, because they had to have a lot of faith that this team was going to be good, at least good enough to not be laughed at for having a beam and then only winning like 30 games. And, you know, because everyone, when it first got introduced, all the jokes were, well, we're not going to see the beam very often. So the the story of the beam is kind of crazy because it's like for the beam to really take hold, this team had to be really good right away. And they were. So that took a lot of guts to introduce that. But I mean, that just added to the the great vibes of the season. And I think I speak for most Kings fans when I say that we couldn't be happier, right? So 
there's really no other rating I could give other than a 10 out of 10. Now moving on to the players. For, for each player, I'll give them their rating. Uh, I'll also show the, the rating that I gave them uh, at midseason. And then I'll give one defining stat or a few defining stats that kind of relate to the same thing that defined their season. And so I'll start out with De'Aaron Fox, who got a 9 at the, uh, the midway point of the season. And he has moved up to a 10 after the second half of the season and the playoff uh, series that he had. I remember halfway through the season, he got a 9 because he was not being consistent throughout entire games, right? He was just showing up in fourth quarters, which is great, but, you know, he wasn't being consistent through all the games, and he wasn't even the best player on the team, which was fine, but uh, I think Sabonis was clearly the best player on the team through the first half of the season, and... Then Fox, in the second half of the season, plus the playoffs, clearly made it his team. He's the best player. He's the the guy that's going to lead us to however far we're going to go, right? We, We go as far as he takes us. And that was something that I think, I mean, I always knew, right? I think a lot of people uh, shared the same opinion and, and still do in that, Sabonis is the guy who's going to keep everything moving on offense, but Fox is going to be the guy that has to be the best player on this team, especially in the playoffs, to take us far, and that was clearly the case. And so the defining stat for for him was leading the league in clutch points, uh, you know, winning clutch player of the year, and shooting efficiently in the clutch at 50, almost 53%. Uh, and doing all of that in pretty much like very similar minutes to everyone below him, or at least the, the people right below him in terms of uh, clutch points. Because being clutch is what defined Fox's season. Like I said, the reason he got a 9 uh, in the other one at, at the midway point was he wasn't doing it the entire game, and he was only doing it in fourth quarters. And, you know... That was the case even after that sometimes, but that's just like what he did. He would save it for the fourth quarters, and during the regular season, a lot of times that's fine, Uh, and during the playoffs, it's not so much, and during the playoffs, he definitely didn't do that as much. He he did it the whole game. I mean, he had 38 points in that game one and, and was averaging a lot of points. I don't know the exact number, but a lot of points well over his season average, around 30 points per game, until he broke his finger. And so definitely being clutch player of the year is the thing that defined this season for De'Aaron Fox. And that's also, you know, the thing that helped him be an all-star and be on an all-NBA team. So a 10 out of 10 for De'Aaron Fox. Sabonis is the next guy that I will talk about, and he was at a 10 at the midway point. He pretty much did everything I could have ever wanted out of him. Uh, And then he slowed down. He did slow down in the second half of the season. And Fox took up being that number one guy. And during the playoffs, he was not the regular season Sabonis that we knew. And so he gets moved down to a 9 out of 10. So him and Fox kind of swap places. You know, I think... I think... If this was next season and the same thing happened, you know, I I said this for the overall team, but I think it applies to Sabonis too. If it's next season and the same things happen, Sabonis doesn't get a 9. He gets a lower rating. But for this season, this season was so much about the regular season, right? And Sabonis did not have a great playoffs. He did not have a 9 out of 10 playoffs. He didn't even have an 8 out of 10 playoffs, right? But I think the regular season was more important this season. And just getting to the playoffs was the part that was important. And so I'm giving that more weight when, when you know, thinking about these ratings. And during the regular season, Sabonis was great. And even in the playoffs, he, he 
was not as good, but I think people are being a little too harsh and not really understanding what he was contributing to the team, even while not scoring or even rebounding. And I think, I, I think his impact is harder to see than Fox's because Fox is just flashier. And so Sabonis' so defining stat is about dribble handoffs and screen assists per game because that's where he impacts the game the most. Sabonis so is the guy that defined how our offense was built. He over doubled second place in the amount of dribble handoffs in that he uh, did in the in the regular season. He had over a thousand dribble handoffs during the regular season, and he also had almost six screen assists per game. And that's why I think it's hard for people to really understand what he's contributing because he's doing it in ways that aren't super flashy. Sometimes his passing can be flashy, and he did average, I think he was near seven assists per game on the season or something like that. But so much of him contributing to the offense is just him standing there, setting good screens and handing it off to guys, and the defense kind of having to respect that because he can either make another pass to someone else that's cutting, he can hand it off to the great shooter that he has coming off the screen, or he can do something himself off the dribble, and that's what makes him so effective. And then also just the pace at which our offense played revolved so much around him being able to grab a rebound, push the ball up the court himself, or just be able to handle the ball himself uh, in the half court. And so he really was the center piece for which the number one offense in the league uh, in terms of offensive rating revolved around. Now in the playoffs, of course, that took a hit. I think the Warriors did a pretty good job of taking away a lot of the dribble handoffs, at least in the first half of that series. But I also think you have to look at the shooting of, of the guys around him. And I think that was also a big reason why Sabonis' numbers dropped, because guys just couldn't hit shots off of his passes. But he also was forcing things inside against Kavon Looney and you know wasn't taking the mid-rangers that were given to him. So those were definitely things that he needs to uh, look at and improve upon for the next time he's in the playoffs, because teams are going to look at what the Warriors did to to make him less effective, and they're going to try to copy it. And so, like I said, if he does the exact same thing next postseason, then his rating is going to drop for me significantly, but because this season was so much about the regular season for us, he still gets a 9 out of 10 for how great he was in the regular season. Harrison Barnes is the next guy that I'll talk about, and at the midway point, he had an 8, and I'm just going to reduce that to a 7. Again, in terms of what rating I would give him in the playoffs, it would be much, much lower, because he got played off the court in the playoffs at times, and that was really rough, and, you know, a lot of our off-season, a lot of the questions for this off-season revolve around him, but I'll, uh, I'll address what we're going to do this off-season in a, a later podcast, but for Harrison Barnes in the regular season, I think his defining stat is playing all 82 games. And I say that because that kind of really embodies who he is of playing all 82 games, just being a consistent veteran for this team that you know he averaged 15 points per game was not, you know, some great, you know, 18 points per game like he's done before, but was just a consistent 15 points per game where when the team needed him, they could go to him and to calm things down, whether it be in the post or him just driving at a guy, he would always draw fouls to calm everything down. He really was just the calm, cool, collected veteran in the regular season that this team needed. In the playoffs, it, it it didn't really go like that, but in the regular season, he was tasked a lot of times with guarding the other team's best wing player. 
which is probably not something he should have to do at this point of his career, but it was what he had to do because we don't have the personnel to have someone else do that. So he was guarding the other team's best player a lot of times while also still averaging 15 points per game. His three-point percentage was down from last season, but he still contributed to, obviously, our, our great shooting because he is a, an above-average three-point shooter still. And he was great at getting to the free-throw line and contributing to us having three players who were great at getting to the free throw line in Fox, Sabonis, and Barnes. You look at their free throws attempted per game, Fox at six per game, Sabonis 5.5, Barnes at five. And the next closest guy on the Kings is Malik Monk with 2.7 per game. So getting, what, like 16, 17 free throw attempts per game from those three guys was pretty important, and I think when I think about this season for Barnes, the number one thing he did was when the offense was not flowing well, he would get to the free throw line. The next guy that I'll talk about is Kevin Herter. He had a nine at the midway point, and I think with the same with Barnes, the same with Sabonis, he just drops one to an eight after his playoff performance. We saw him go through, you know, his his hot streaks, his cold spells, and it's hard to tell whether the playoffs was just happened to be a, a cold spell or whether it was more the pressure getting to him or what. I mean we saw with the Hawks he had like one good playoff game and the arrests weren't great, so, you know, it's hard to to say. But that is one thing about this team, is we are young and gaining more experience, and so hopefully he'll be better next time and be able to actually hit threes. But throughout the season, you know, like I said, he would go through his cold spells, but a great three-point shooter at over 40%. And I think his defining stat was he was first in taking dribble handoffs uh, in dribble handoff frequency and was seventh in points per handoff among uh, guys that had a certain amount. I forget the amount of, of dribble handoffs, but, you know, some qualifying amount. And so him just being able to play off Sabonis, they're really a perfect match, Herter being able to come off those dribble handoffs, hit those sidestep threes, but then on top of that, him being able to play make out of that, you know, if guys are coming over the screens, he can drive inside. And I think that is one thing that he did well in the playoffs. It was still being able to get inside and some get to his floater or his mid-range shot or be able to play make out of that. And, you know, you still he was still doing that despite not hitting his threes in the postseason. And he did that in the regular season as well. I remember, I think it was in my uh, mid-season grades podcast that I brought up stats about uh, his rough three-point shooting spells versus his, you know, really hot shooting spells, and his two-point percentage in both of those didn't change. So his three-point percentage, he was not letting how he was shooting from three affect the other parts to his game and I think that's really important him being able to still be a threat handling the ball and, and creating for others and getting to that floater that he has and he does have a good one and then defensively for him this season was a bit up and down he's a very weird defender sometimes he has really good games where he's using his length he's staying in front of his guy and he's, you know, deflecting balls. And then there are other games where he's just getting driven straight past. Um, so it, he's just very inconsistent defensively. I think that's a, a common theme amongst Kings players. But I think it's, it's especially obvious with him. But he did uh, help the defense in terms of just having long arms and being pretty tall. And so he was... The defense was better with him out there than a guy like Malik Monk, I think. 
not because he's better at like moving his feet than Monk or staying in front of his guy, but just because he just because of his physical attributes, being able to be more more of a nuisance. And I do have faith in Herder that he will not shoot horribly from three next time we're in the postseason. Now moving on to Malik Monk, who had an eight in the midseason ratings podcast, and he kind of like uh, Fox moves up to a nine. He didn't. I don't think he really improved from the first half of the regular season to the second half of the regular season. So this improvement in grade is more about the playoffs. Although I did think I do think he shot better in the second half of the regular season from three because he started off pretty poorly from three. But obviously all regular season long, he was a great bench scorer. I believe he was ninth in bench scoring in the league. I think the really important part of his game was his playmaking, especially his playmaking with Sabonis off Sabonis pick and rolls, being able to feed it inside to Sabonis so many times. You see that Sabonis pick and roll, and he would just slot a pass right to Sabonis for an easy dunk or an easy layup. And then I think the other thing that Malik Monk brought to this team was just the swagger. I mean, he is a guy that's not afraid of the moment, as we saw in the playoffs. He's always willing to obviously take a big shot, and he's going to let the other team know about it if he makes it. And he can also have massive games. I mean, we saw that in game one of the playoffs with 32. He had, what was it, 45 in that double overtime game against the Clippers. But I think the defining stat for him was his increase in points per game from the regular season to the playoffs. He increased it by 4.5 points per game, which was uh, first among bench or his total points per game in the playoffs was first among bench players in the playoffs. Or sorry, I said 4.5. He increased it by 5.5 to 19 points per game in the playoffs which was very needed with obviously Kevin Herter and Harrison Barnes both struggling. And I think the most important part of his play in the playoffs was kind of like I said in the regular season, his playmaking, but also just his ability to get downhill and actually drive towards the basket because, you know, obviously Fox can do that. Sabonis was struggling with the ball in his hands a bit. And then, you know, obviously Herter was struggling, which meant he was getting less minutes Davion Mitchell's not the best ball handler. You know, he's fine, but... So when you look at guys who can handle the ball, it's Fox. And then we needed that second guy. And Monk was ready to be that guy. And he got to the foul line a lot. And without him, I mean, our offense in the playoffs would have just been horrible. Because if it wasn't Fox with the ball in his hands, nobody could do anything. I think he really is the perfect sixth man. You know, he's he's not the most consistent player. Uh, so that's probably why he, you know, still comes off the bench, but he is that absolute scorer off the bench who can also play make a bit, you know, the the Lou Williams, the Jamal Crawford type, and a guy that can end games uh with either it could be, you know, like Fox, Sabonis, him and then Keegan Murray and Barnes or Herder in there. You know, there's a lot of different lineups that we could go with with him still being in the lineup to end the game. Now I will talk about uh, Keegan Murray, who went from a 7 all the way up to a 9. And I think his rating increasing by 2 from the midway point to now, I think really reflects him growing as a player because he did grow a lot uh, throughout this season and then you could obviously especially see it in the playoffs having a really rough first three games and then having a really good last four games and I said it after the series uh, against the Warriors the or one of the biggest things like one of the top two biggest things takeaways from that Warrior series was just how good Keegan Murray was in the last four games of that series and how he grew and that's the most exciting thing about what happened in that series 
he obviously surpassed everyone's expectations in terms of his three-point shooting. His three-point shooting increased from college to the NBA because he was obviously getting more open looks. He led the team in three-point percentage at 41.1%, which is his defining stat, and obviously set the rookie three-point record with 206 three-pointers made on the season. But his improvement came in other areas. His improvement came with the handling the ball, being able to you know, at least handle the ball around a screen and take a midi. We saw that, you know, improvement in the second half of the season where he wasn't really comfortable handling the ball at all in the first half of the season. You know, we only saw that a few times for him, from him. And you could see his bag just expand as the season went along and you could see him get more comfortable. My worry with him going into the playoffs was always him defensively. And being a liability. And that's why I thought he wasn't going to be able to stay on the court. Because he wouldn't be good enough defensively. And then he wouldn't be adding enough offensively if he was just being a shooter. And they could probably, you know, pay attention to him. Stick to him pretty well. But I was totally wrong, at least after the first three games. I mean, there was that one game where he played like 45 minutes. That was insane for a rookie to be able to play 45 minutes in a playoff game is crazy. And for him to just come in to the NBA, start immediately, and contribute to the third seed uh, in the Western Conference, and be able to contribute in the playoffs, and be able to shoot the way he did consistently throughout the season, was very unexpected. And very nice to see. And, you know, he said that it was the perfect situation to be drafted into. And that is nice to... I mean, coming into the season, we said it like, we don't need Keegan Murray to be our savior anymore. And that's nice for a a guy being drafted here. Because everyone else before him, you know, maybe not Davion Mitchell, but everyone else before that, when they got drafted by the Kings, it's like, you need to save us. Please save us. But he was able to come in, still play an impactful role starting, but he didn't need to, you know, have all the pressure to be the guy on him. And thank you, Fox and Halliburton, for actually saving us. Even if Halliburton isn't still here, he still saved us by being good enough to be traded for Sabonis. But yeah, 9 out of 10 rookie season for him, and he's only going to get better, and that's very exciting. The next guy we'll talk about is our defensive specialist, Davion Mitchell, who got a very low compared to everyone else's uh, rating, a 6.5 at the midway point of the season. And he got the 6.5 because uh, he just, he wasn't as good offensively this year, uh, at the start of this year as he was last year. Uh, and he he didn't have as much of a role, less minutes, uh, because of the acquisitions of Mon, Carter, even Keegan Murray. It was taking away minutes just because even though they don't play the same position, it's still another guy that can be out there. Uh, so we weren't going small as much with him. And I was just disappointed that he didn't, didn't show any growth offensively. But I think he really showed his value in the playoffs. And just a quick pause here, because I realized during recording this, I didn't actually say what rating I was giving Davion Mitchell. So I'm giving him an 8 for this season. You know, I I think Mike Malone said something recently. He's like, specialists don't play in the playoffs, which I don't actually know what the context around that was. But I don't think that's true because you know calling Davion a specialist I mean he is he's a defensive specialist he's not a great offensive player although I it feels like he could be a lot better but when you have a team that's not good defensively it makes a little bit of room for a defensive specialist to be out there especially in the playoffs and so he did show his value 
he also hit some big threes and wasn't afraid to shoot the threes, which was a big a big thing in the playoffs. And for him, it's just, I really do feel like there is something there offensively. It, I really think that you know, when, when you watch him play, he's so quick. He is a really good handle, and he can get to the, the step back or just the crossover into a midi, and it looks so good. And when he does that and pulls up into a midi and hits it, it looks so good. But then he just, like, will stop. Well, like, won't do that for a while. And he makes a lot of those middies, too. I mean, when the shot is falling for him, he he's really good. But it, it really feels like he can do more off the dribble than he does. It really feels like he can be. He has the ability to be a good offensive player. And so hopefully he can get there. But this season, I do think he showed that he can still be a rotational player, uh, especially in the playoffs. Guarding a guy like Steph Curry, that is where he is most valuable. And he's extremely fun to watch defensively. And if he can just knock down league average from three, which he didn't in the playoff series, but he was good enough, uh, I think, to be out there. And so that's why he gets bumped up to an eight. I do think in the second half of the season, he was also just better defensively and and offensively. I think he settled into his role in the second half of the season better. And now we go to the last guy who was a consistent rotational player. And we had eight guys who were consistent in the rotation the whole season. And so that is Trey Lyles, who I gave a 9-2 at the midway point, and he stays a 9. He was very consistent all season. I think he is one of the most underrated players in the NBA. He was He's one of my favorite players on this team. You know, he may be my second favorite player outside of De'Aaron Fox, and he is a free agent this offseason. Hopefully, we can keep him, but I think don't, there's like not really a stat that can show his effort and consistency, which is probably why he's underrated, but he's a really good uh, rebounder. He can get offensive rebounds. He's always hustling, and he averaged the third most uh, rebounds per game in the playoffs for us. And he did that all while playing like half as many minutes of the starters or, or Monk. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the guys that were playing big minutes, he only played like 16, 17 minutes per game and was still averaging the third most rebounds, which maybe that's an indictment of our rebounding. But uh, he is a very good rebounder, can obviously knock down the three uh, effectively. He can give us a jolt off the bench. And he was part of the bench unit that in the playoffs, I was just waiting to, you know, come save us when the starters would start off the game super slowly offensively. And then Monk and Lyles would come in and give us that jolt offensively. When you look at him and like just watch him play, he makes things look pretty easy. Like just driving to the basket and getting layups, making the simple passes, knocking down open shots, just being a good team defender. Like he's just an extremely solid rotational player. You know, he's not going to be a starter on any team, but he can be a very effective rotational player because of just how solid he is on both ends of the floor. Doesn't make many mistakes. And, you know, he's always ready to take a he's always ready to take a big transition 3 to cap off a big run. And when he hits those threes, it's amazing, big crowd explosion, and when he doesn't hit him, it's annoying, because it's like, why did you take that three? But he's always ready to take them. Now we move on to the guys that didn't consistently get play time, but, you know, sometimes did. And uh, I'll start off with Terrence Davis, who got a very bad grade um, at the midway point of the season at a three. Uh, he gets bumped up to a, a six. We obviously all know about TNTD, the big game on on TNT, 
Uh, he is obviously never afraid to come out and get shots up. You know, and I thought coming into the season, for him to have a role, it had to be as a 3 and D player. And that's kind of what happened. Uh, I mean, he wasn't good enough at it to get consistent minutes. That's why he wasn't, you know, in the top eight. But I think he was a guy that, well, well, he was a guy coming into the season that I had hopes for. Like, he could be the guy that surprises people and, and does make the rotation and is the surprise guy that contributes. And he wasn't, and that was disappointing. But I still think he did contribute when his name was called. He had 17 games in double-digit scoring this season. Five games scoring over 20 points. And he did that on 5.7 shots per game, which he averaged 13 minutes per game. So like I said, he's he's going to get his shots up. He's going to score, uh, well, sometimes. He's going to score half of the time. Half of the games he's going to go off. Half of the games he's going to miss his first three threes and then get subbed out and never play again, which is kind of the thing with him. But he did. He played in the playoffs. He was guarding Curry in those last two games, which I didn't agree with, but he did a pretty good job of it in game six. In game seven, he was horrible. I don't, I I mean, but I think that's a little unfair to him to have to guard Steph Curry when you have a guy like Davion Mitchell there. Why was he guarding him? But anyways, I think Terrence Davis played well in his role of being a guy that was in and out of the lineup, but just if we needed that scoring, that three-point shooting, then he would play, and he was up and down defensively, but I think, uh, you know, a, a solid season for him. The next guy is Chimizi Metu, who for a lot of the season was in the rotation, and so he got a seven at the midway point, but he drops to a five. He... I mean, he was in the rotation for a lot of seasons. Sometimes he wasn't, and then he totally fell out in the last two weeks plus the playoffs. I think the defining stat for him is uh, that he played... I I couldn't actually find numbers for this, but if I were to guess, like over 90% of his minutes at center, uh, and only shot 0.6 threes per game, which for him is an improvement in that he wasn't shooting threes because he's not a good three-point shooter. He adapted to a role, a new role, not being a power forward or whatever. He was a center who was going to move the ball when he got it at the three-point line and not jack up a three and just run to the rim, catch lobs, set screens, try to rebound. He's undersized, and that's why he why we went with Len later. But, I mean, Metu, he's not hes not a good defender. He's just not. He's also not a great offensive player. He was just the guy that was playing because we had no one else. I don't know why Len didn't get a shot earlier in the season, but then, you know, even when Len wasn't in the rotation, even in the playoffs, it wasn't Metu that came in. It was Lyles who went to the five. And that's why... It's like Metu, he did a good job, which is why he gets a five, of trying to adapt to a role that probably wasn't fit for him and being asked to do something that he probably shouldn't have had to do. You know, he bought into to his role. But, um, and, and at times was actually pretty good. At times he was good at protecting the rim as best he could and, and catching lobs and running the floor. But he just didn't have the, doesn't have the physical attributes to really be able to play center super effectively and then just isn't like talented enough offensively to justify him being out there then the next guy is Alex Len who got a four at the midway point because he just really wasn't playing all that much he gets bumped up to a seven I I've always been a big Alex Len fan and was actually excited when he came back to the team for his second stint and then he just didn't play and I was disappointed. And then all of a sudden, in the last two weeks of the season, he just gets inserted into the lineup as the backup center. And then all of a sudden in the playoffs, he's playing minutes, you know, like nine minutes per game or eight minutes per game, whatever it was. And he's playing really well. 
He was setting screens, blocking shots, dunking the ball, and that's all he needed to do. And maybe he gets a higher rating because I just forgot what it was like to have a competent backup center and a seven-footer. But it was just so nice to see a guy who could just set a really good screen off the bench, because obviously we know Sabonis can do that. But off the bench, set a really nice screen when Sabonis isn't out there, and then dunk the ball. And then I think his rim protection was something that we needed, because uh, we just don't really have another rim protector other than him. And a nice stat I found for him was he had the best defensive and offensive rating of, of players who played, like, regularly uh, in the playoffs for the Kings. And he played only 26 games in the regular season. And he played in all seven playoff games. Now, the last two games, he wasn't as much in the rotation, but he still played in them at least. But he, he really did contribute in the first five games. And I'm just, I'm a big Alex Len fan. So it made me happy that he got into the rotation. The next guy is a guy who wasn't on the team at the midway point of the regular season. And that is Kessler Edwards, who I give a 6 to because he slightly surpassed expectations. We traded for him in just a money-saving move for the Nets. And so we didn't give anything up. And I tried to keep my expectations low because normally, like this happened with Casey Arpaola too, like I'm trying to keep my expectations low. But when I see a guy that's like, you know, a young defensive guy who can maybe shoot the three, I get really excited. I'm like, oh, this could be our three and D guy, right? Um, but I tried to, you know, not have those expectations as much because it's just like the Nets are giving him up for a reason. But I thought he was pretty good. He had the, the game against the Nets where he finished the game in crunch time, was guarding Devin Booker really well, uh, and knocked down a clutch three. Uh, he shot 34.9% from three, and he did start three games out of the 22 that he played with the Kings. I think he's not afraid to shoot the three ball, which I think is a good thing. It's something that you know, I compare him to Casey Paula. They play similar roles, obviously. And Casey Paula is afraid to shoot the ball. Kessler Edwards is going to get that thing up if he's open. And I think that's a good thing. Because Kessler Edwards, you know, he shouldn't be taking shots if, they're, if he's not wide open. But when he's wide open, a guy like him needs to shoot the ball. And then if he can't make it, well, then he's not going to be on be in the rotation but also if he doesn't shoot it, it's he's not going to be in the rotation. So pretty much he just he needs to make them. And he shot, like I said, 35% pretty much. So if he could just get that up a little more, I do think he has a rotation spot. I'm pretty sure the Kings are going to bring him back next season. And I do think he can be a rotational guy off the bench, a 3 and D guy that can help our, our defense if he can just shoot a league average from three, maybe get it up a little bit. Then we move to the most disappointing player of this season, and that is Rashawn Holmes. He got a one at the midway point. He gets a one again. He just didn't really play much. He played in 42 games and averaged eight minutes per game in those games. And a lot of that was garbage time. You know, he started the one game against the Lakers and was really good in it. And then didn't get an opportunity after that, which I was disappointed about. I thought, you know, because at the time we were going with Metu. And then Rashawn started that game. I felt like we should have given him a chance after that to see if he really could add something. Because, you know, it's not like Metu was giving us anything. It's not like anything was being taken away by taking Metu out of the rotation. But he didn't get that chance. But when he did get a chance earlier in the season, he was really bad. His push shot wasn't going in at all. And, you know, it's rough because he had a starting spot, right? He was used to a certain role, and then he just totally got taken out of that role, and he wasn't able to adapt to it. Um, you know, obviously earlier in or in his career when he was on the Kings, when he got first got to the Kings, he was a backup center, uh, and he was able to earn that starting role. 
and he wasn't he's not able to do the same things in the backup role now as he did when he first got here and, and it's just disappointing because you know everyone loves Rashawn Holmes but he just he just hasn't found his place here and that just sucks and I he might just keep sitting on our roster not playing because of his contract two more years I think it's like 10 mil a year I don't think anyone wants to take that contract and I don't think we're going to be willing to give anything up to get someone to take the contract unless we really need to because we have another move in place that requires it. And so we may just be stuck with this for a couple more seasons of just sad Rashawn Holmes times. The last guy that gets a grade is Matthew Del Vadova, the last guy that I feel like played enough to get a grade. He got a 9 at the midway point of the season just because... He came in, did his thing, played his role when uh, when Fox went down for a little bit. And now that it's the end of the season, I'm giving him a 10, because why not? Because he came in, and we didn't expect him to be anything. You know, it would be nice to actually have like a third string point guard, but we had him. And when he came in, he was actually good defensively. And he hit the three to set the franchise single game three point record. So that's why he gets the 10. And also from all accounts, he was a really good locker room guy. There's a story about that Terrence Davis told about him getting advice from Del Vadova about like just being able to stay ready after he fell out of the rotation. And so it really seemed like Del Vadova, from what everyone says, was a really good leader for the team. He did just sign with, uh, was it Melbourne United, I think. So he is going back to the NBL in Australia. But it was a, it was a fun season with Matthew Delavadova. Then we have some guys that don't get grades. Uh, Casey Paula, who got injured and then waived. Uh, he had a 7 at the midway point of the season, which was probably a little high, to be honest. Uh, he probably shouldn't have gotten that high. Uh, with Kessler Edwards coming in, I I I don't think we're gonna bring Casey Akpola back. We might though. I thought before it was more likely that he would be brought back. That we would just like wave him for now, bring in PJ Dozier, and then re-sign him the next season to like see what he has again after the injury. But now that we do have Kessler Edwards kind of filling that role, I mean maybe we bring him back. I don't know, but just kind of sucks that he got injured. He is a great defensive player, but I, I don't think his three-point shooting is good enough at this point to be a rotational player. Nemeas Keita had a four at the midway point of the season. He didn't get really any shots after a few, like, three games uh, at the beginning of the season, in, in the first half of the season. Um, I do think he's a guy that could possibly be in the rotation at some point in the future, because he is a seven footer. If he can do what Alex Len does, right, and set screens, dunk the ball, and block shots, which is that's his game. If he can do that, plus he's a pretty solid passer. So I think that if he can do what Alex Len does, plus the passing, he can find a, a spot as a as a backup center on this team because we do need shot blocking, and then his passing could fit into our offense still. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with him, if he just stays as a two-way player for us, or, or what happens. Then other guys, Keon Ellis, two-way player, he didn't really play much in the NBA, but you know, a defensive guy who shot really well from three in the G League, and uh, so could be a 3 and D guy that we look at in the future. PJ Dozier, a guy who we signed because Casey Paula got injured, didn't really play much. Also, 3 and D guy, you can tell. We're trying to find someone that's a 3 and D guy that can really fit in the rotation. He wasn't that. I, I don't know if he sticks around. I'm leaning towards probably no on that one. He didn't really get any chance. I just, in the last game of the season, my biggest memory for him is when he played point guard uh, in the last game of the season because we were resting everyone in the second half of the game against Denver. And then, shout out to two other guys who did play. Chima Moneki, who got waived by midseason, he played in two games. Deontay Burton played in two games on a 10-day contract. 
So just shout out to those guys. That is everyone who played for the Kings this season. In a great season, the vibes of this season will we'll never probably get another season like this. I mean, hopefully we get very, you know, good vibe seasons in the future. Maybe even like better vibes in terms of winning a championship at some point, right? But it'll never be the same as this. This was definitely a unique season and a 10 out of 10 season. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell to not miss any of these videos that I'm making over the summer into next season. Uh, the next video will probably be looking forward to the off season. If you're listening to the audio version of the podcast, make sure to leave a rating and a review. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore the real report, and I will see you guys next time to look forward to this off season. Peace.